this presentation uh, will touch on nutrients, energetics, and metabolism. It's not going to be a presentation of three equal parts, and I think that will become evident shortly. Sorry, the reasons why will become evident shortly. But um, I felt it was important to, to go back to basics and, and run through what we mean by nutrients. Um, and then that leads naturally into an exploration of energetics, uh, what we know currently, and I'll be scratching the surface of that and then leading in a little to metabolism and just how um, what we know a little what we know about amphibian metabolism. I do want to acknowledge some co some colleagues in the field. Uh, Dr. Kevin Wright um, was a long-standing supporter of amphibian science um, and um, a contributor to chapters on amphibian nutrition. Dr. Ellen Dierenfeld is someone who will be known to many in the food nutrition field and has written widely on nutrition in general, in general, excuse me. And um, the person really who, who knows most about this, I think, is Dr. Andrea Brennan Soto um, and uh, has been doing some amazing things in this area. Um, I won't be able to do their work the justice uh, as if they were presenting, but um, I do want to acknowledge their their contributions to, to the content that you're going to see today. So with that, uh, let's kick off looking at nutrients. Okay. So um, nutrients are substances that provide nourishment, essential for growth, maintenance, and they're ingested and absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract. All food is composed of smaller building blocks. And as you see, as we go through today's presentation, those building blocks listed out here are actually comprised of smaller units themselves. I'm sure this is uh, not entirely new to you, but it's just helpful that we all share this same foundation. There are other substances in food, um, uh, and I've listed several here, so there's many that are present particularly in plants um, but uh, you'll see that there there will be um, there are many that i'm not touching on here i'm just highlighting a couple mostly because um, they they come up in relation to health um, and it's beyond the scope of today's session to cover them um, but just wanted to bring that to your attention that food is we think of it very much in positive nutritive terms but there may also be substances present that are working against those uh, nutrients or providing an additional challenge when we think about absorption and metabolism and something else which i hope will be helpful as you think about the other presentations in the series or start to read materials for yourself, maybe even read feed labels, is understanding um, how we as nutritionists talk about feedstuff components. So whenever you do analysis of feeds, there's something called proximate analysis, uh, which is a standard set of agreed chemical analyses and they break down feeds into, first of all, you um, eliminate the water or measure the water, and you're left with the dry matter. The dry matter can be further split into organic matter and inorganic matter. Organic matter comprises carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, vitamins, and the inorganic matter is what we would term ash or minerals. And then there are further divisions, and we're just going to walk through some of these um, in brief. And I don't, I won't be an exhaustive um, exploration of these. Water is often overlooked as a nutrient, so we'll start there. Um, 
it provides no energy it, it doesn't provide any calories but um, if not present in sufficient quantity feeds may not be palatable um, and um, water is important for intestinal motility being able to actually have food pass through the gut um, and as we'll see later absorption and distribution of water soluble nutrients may be diminished because that's where they're present um, the water content in feeds can be highly variable due to a variety of factors i now live in an incredibly dry climate so any feeds that are left out in in the climate dry out very rapidly and um, i would contrast that to any feeds in areas that are uh, open to the elements back in my hometown of glasgow which is very wet um, so just through ambient conditions, water content and feeds can be very variable, but there is also a number of other factors. So for this reason, um, we there's always a very strong preference to express feedstuffs, uh, the composition of feedstuffs on a dry matter basis so that you're accurately comparing the nutrient concentration between different feeds. If you're, I think in one of the previous presentations, there was um, uh, many of the feeds that we we receive are thinking about um, live prey in particular. They're, when we're feeding them, we're feeding them as is, which means with water. But when you come to understand the nutrient, nutritional composition of them, which is a, a presentation later this morning, it will be expressed on a dry matter basis. So that irrespective of the size of the animal, any variation, um, there's an ability to look and check and determine whether the concentration of nutrients is different. So let's move on to the dry matter constituents. And here it's important to split out those constituents into the fact that they are um, digestible material which is what is easily digested by our own enzymes i'm sort of speaking literally here uh the animal enzymes and which would include the ability to metabolize or digest carbohydrates lipids and proteins then fermentable only materials which um those are animal proteins um, sorry, our animal enzymes cannot digest, but microorganism, microorganisms in the animal's gut can process. Um, and then uh, there's a whole category here of indigestible materials, which we'll also touch on, uh, which can include organic compounds such as lignin and chitin, um, and also these inorganic compounds as minerals. And the important thing here is that neither of those provide energy. So a really brief run through those different categories. Carbohydrates can provide energy. Um, the yield is 4, cal, 4 kcals per gram. And as you'll see a pattern as we go through, tend to think about nutrients by breaking them up into categories. Um, so we have the simple um, simple carbohydrates or sugars and starches, um, and we're really not going to dwell a lot on them here, A, because they're not the dominant, um, they're not the dominant nutrient in most of the feeds that are, that we're using to feed amphibians, um, and um, also most amphibians cannot digest these compounds well at least to the best of our knowledge. But simple carbohydrates are sugars and starches and complex carbohydrates include hemicellulose, cellulose, pectins and gums, which we would find in plants, but also chitin. Um, and this is, would be a form of fiber, whether plant or animal fiber, that plays a role in promoting gut motility. Ooh, I think. Yeah, sorry, that was um, an error there. Uh, 
fats are another energy source and provide the fats or lipids uh, provide the most energy per gram. Compare that to what we were just looking at before. Uh, of four fats provide nine kcals per gram. Um, they're important because every cell membrane comprises a phospholipid bilayer. So they're the basis of all cell membranes. Um, essential fatty acids must be provided in the diet. De novo, they cannot be made by the animal. Um, and the requirement for essential fatty acids varies by species and isn't very well understood, if at all, for amphibians. Non-essential fatty acids can be made from those other fatty acids. Um, and the other factor that we think about when we're examining lipids is that um, it's not only the absolute amount of fat that's consumed, it's the balance of different fatty acids, whether they're saturated, polyunsaturated, um, and you'll know these terms, I'm sure, from, from human nutrition and human diets, but um, also looking at the ratios of N3 to N6 fatty acids, which are believed to be involved in either promoting or uh, reducing inflammation. And I, I think other speakers will, will talk to that when we, when we get to talk about health. Protein um, is also a source of energy. Um, and this is going to be critical for amphibians because it is understood that true carnivores, so there's um, there's a whole taxa of carnivores, but many of them don't all have a, an entirely obligate carnivory eating strategy. Um, they may be more accurately classed as omnivores. So if we're thinking a good example here would be to think about felids. Um, cats are considered true carnivores, uh, whereas dogs would be considered omnivores. And cats require um, they use protein for energy because they cannot digest carbohydrates particularly well. They lack the enzymes to do that. So therefore, any other species that have, demonstrates that dependence or entirely carnivorous feeding strategy will be likened to a felid. Um, the nutrients are the, um, are the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And the distinction is that nitrogen is the key element. And the reason for calling that out is because the analysis for protein is actually an analysis that digests all of the food until you're left with the nitrogen content. So there's some pretty aggressive chemistry that's happening um, until you're titrating out the nitrogen concentration. And then there's an agreement that um, crude protein is multiplying that nitrogen by 6.25, irrespective of the feed type that's being analyzed. This is the, the average that is used. So it does mean that there's some variation in that, um, in that assessment, hence the term crude. And just like we were talking about with fatty acids, there are essential and non-essential amino acids. Essential amino acids must be provided in the diet. Um, and the one that we think about as being essential for felids is to add taurine um, on top of others because they cannot make that from other amino acids. Um, and there's... Um, some evidence that the balance of amino acids and proteins influences fat metabolism and storage. And we know this by studying things like um, understanding the effects of the deficiency of methionine and lysine in birds. But this really is not well understood or, or known in amphibians. Excuse me, sorry, a couple of extra slides in there. Now, the important thing here with nitrogen is that there is also this category of non-protein nitrogen. So when you're doing that analysis and getting that number based on 
the nitrogen content of a feed, what it's not doing is taking account of non-protein nitrogen. Or another term is bound protein. Um, so if you come across that in the literature, this is what it's referring to. So the bottom line is that our estimates of protein may be artificially elevated when we're doing analysis. And particularly when we think about invertebrates, which uh, we've been um, uh, talking about is um, a, a predominant source of prey items for uh, amphibians in managed populations. Um, chitin is an integral part of the exoskeleton of invertebrates and contains about 7% nitrogen. So that would suggest that, as is stated here, our estimates of protein may be, um, may be high. And this issue of um, understanding the true nutritive value of insects has been explored, at least, um, in forex insectivorous mammals. Um, and there's some evidence that with the appropriate gut microbes, then um, there is uh, the potential for digestibility of, um, of chitin. Um, but there's no evidence that that nitrogen that is released is actually available for absorption by mammalian insectivores. So the protein level being artificially elevated because of the chitin. If you have the right microbes in your gut, you may be able to digest that chitin and release some of that nitrogen, but it's not certain whether that would actually contribute to your protein requirements. And um, this is uh, borrowed from, from another presentation, um, but there's interest and it's, it, there's evidence um, from a paper that suggests that um, this form of non-protein nitrogen, or um, I think a subtitle could be waste not, want not, uh, suggests that there, um, there's the ability of cave adapted salamanders here to repurpose nitrogen excreted in um, bat feces. Kind of interesting result for the morning. So moving on to vitamins. Vitamins are organic compounds. I want to make the, the distinction here that they're require they're usually present in minute quantities, um, but also have that role of being essential for maintenance, growth, and reproduction. Again, it's that split. Um, so there's the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K. They're absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract with lipids or fats and can be stored. I am sorry, I'm seeing typos here. Um, stored in fat. This creates the conditions for hypervitaminosis, which is high or toxic levels of these vitamins. Contrast that with water soluble vitamins, which are the B complexes and C. And most are not stored and need to be fed regularly. So there needs to be a regular or consistent supply. And as a consequence, that's more likely to result in hypovitaminosis, low or deficient levels. Just some, um, some high level pointers about these vitamins uh, in brief. Vitamin A, you're going to hear a little bit more about, I think, in relation to carotenoids but uh, they're measured in tissue to, tissues and blood as, as the compound retinol and stored in liver. There's a conversion from retinol to international units of vitamin A. Um, and then know that um, uh, vitamin A can be synthesized from beta carotene and in fact, some other carotenoids in some animals. Um, but I'm going to go back to that field model and, and, uh, and share the Felids require vitamin A preformed because they're not capable of synthesis. So it may be the case that for some amphibians, this is also true. Um, as I mentioned before, um, 
fat soluble vitamins can result in um, because of that ability to store them um, you can end up with toxic levels in diets or toxic stores but the other thing that can happen here is that there can be interactions between vitamins um, such that they're antagonistic for others. Um, in studies, early studies at least, insects are found to be either low or lack vitamin A. And so that always presented the question of whether or not this is a concern for insectivores. But we're going to have another speaker this morning that will expand on, on insect composition and, and possibly comment with more current data here. Um, vitamin D is found in two sources. So there's D2 found in plant sources and D3 found in animal sterols or bats. Um, there are a number of species listed, listed here which have a requirement for the D3 form um, and we also know about the interaction between um, vitamin D and UV light and high levels can be toxic. Again there's going to be another speaker talking about UV light um, so I'm not going to expand on that today. Vitamin E is an interesting one and may not be very important for amphibians, but at least in other uh, species where it's been studied, other zoo species, the requirements uh, seem to be much higher than um, what is published for domestic animals or livestock. It's stored in all tissues, not only the liver, and, and that may be one of the reasons why we believe that the zoo animals have vitamin E deficiencies. So it's an unusual uh, instance here where in fact it's fat soluble, but more often it's very hard to induce the toxicity. Um, it's, it's more the more commonly observed phenomenon is deficiency, um, but true requirements are, are unknown. And what we do know is that there's um, uh, stress increases the requirements. For herbivores, um, they're going to get their source of vitamin E in dark leafy plants, whole prey and oily seeds. Sorry, dark leafy plants and oily seeds. Um, and then anything consuming those items. So that would be, um, I'm thinking again of our insects consuming leafy plants. They're going to be a potential source um, um, of vitamin E in their diet that contributes to their vitamin E con con composition. Um, whenever we're feeding meat um, on its own, which likely wouldn't be the case often with amphibians, but whenever you're feeding just muscle meat, then the vitamin E composition would be lower. And it is not stored well and seems to act more like a water soluble vitamin. The last of the, the fat soluble vitamins, uh, the vitamin K, comes from the fact that um, it, it acts as a coagulation factor um, and that's how it got its name. Um, this can be synthesized by gut microbes, so therefore it's not a problem for um, animals that have the ability to uh, host those microbes, um, but it um, can be a problem when we can't provide those diets in captivity. Um, and there's this relationship because um, warfarin uh, can cause a deficiency by mimicking but not functioning as vitamin K does as that causing factor. So that's the action uh, that's going on there. Vitamin C is synthesized in the liver of most animals, except um, the, the ones listed here, and they must acquire vitamin C through their diet. Um, I couldn't find any information about amphibians, um, um, but that um, somebody else on this call may have some information here. Uh, it's rarely a problem um, that I've seen described. And then this is another one that I think is of interest when we talk about health issues uh, later in the webinar series is the relationship of B vitamins 
um, to health issues. And um, there are a number of B vitamins listed here, again, produced largely by bacteria. Um, and so therefore, if the if the host animal has the appropriate gut microbes, then they would be able to produce the B vitamins independently. But for monogastric animals, so this would include our amphibians here, I'm going to group them in um, because they have a simple stomach. They're not stored and need to be continually replenished. Now, you'll be, I think, happy to hear that we're not going to go through minerals in all that detail. But the contrast here is that compared with vitamins, which I said were organic compounds, and you remember that chart at the beginning, minerals are inorganic compounds and they are equally essential for maintenance, growth, and reproduction, but they're found in two sort of again, two categories. Macro minerals are normally described in terms of requirements or in feeds on a percent basis. Micro minerals or trace minerals are generally expressed um, on a milligram per kilogram or parts per million, those two, um, those two units are equivalent. Um, and the reason for putting this picture up when I describe minerals is it's a mineral wheel. And I appreciate there's a lot of text here, but um, I think sometimes some of the audio hasn't been um, getting through. So I think it's really important to appreciate that um, there are interactions happening all the time with, and you could actually place, you could expand this, this could be minerals, it could be, it could include vitamins, it could include all of those other groups that we started talking about with its carbohydrates and proteins. But let's just stick to minerals for now. And it's showing that the, the balance uh, between minerals is critically important. And wherever you see a line, between two minerals uh, with an arrow on it, there's a direct relationship. So if we sort of think about this as being um, north, south, east, and west, um, calcium and phosphorus is on this sort of north, south axis, and there are arrows in both directions. So therefore, if we when we think about calcium, concentrations, which has come up multiple times in relation to pre-composition, quality, um, maybe even water quality in relation to health issues. It's going to come up in relation to UV. You cannot look at calcium independently of looking at phosphorus um, because you're striving for, irrespective of, of the species that you're, you're looking at, you're striving for a ratio of calcium to phosphorus in the bone of two to one. But if you only have two, if you have 2% calcium, but you have 3% phosphorus, you're going to have an imbalance. And be looking at all the other things that calcium and phosphorus are interacting with. So that isn't meant to alarm anybody, but it's just meant to highlight the complexity that we're facing here. I thought this might be helpful uh, to look at, um, which is um, as you start to use this information for yourself, there's uh, some guidance and I'm going to, somebody reminds me in the chat, uh, the Q&A, there's some guidance on how to understand feed labels and understand what your um, what you're actually purchasing or how to, it'll, I think it will help when you, you uh, compare supplements or products that you're buying. Um, and there are regulations, and I'm now in the US and there are regulations in the UK and, and probably in all the countries where uh, you're sitting right now um, around not only human food, but very specifically animal food. Um, and I picked out pet food because there's a lot of public discourse because of the proliferation of pet feeds out there and what they're trying to sell you. Um, but there's this guaranteed analysis um, 
where they talk about, and it's helpful to understand what these numbers are actually meaning by comparison with what you might find if you were to send those feeds to a lab to compare and check that what it says on the tin um, or pack or bag is actually what you're getting on a regular basis. And this also just pulls out that crude terms, the term crude refers to the specific method of testing the product. I mentioned crude protein, you'll also see crude fat, not the quality of the nutrient itself. And you may see more information on the materials that you purchase. My guidance would be if this information isn't present, contact the manufacturer and just ask for them for as much information as they can share. If they're not willing to share their information, then I would probably have concerns about uh, wanting to, to use their products. You also want to know about changes. And I think this is changes in products in relation to supplements, I think is, um, is really important. Um, I'm not going into a lot of detail about um, the different forms of calcium, uh, or for example, the ratio of calcium to phosphorus in a product, but these would be things to be checking because they do change over time. Um, and something else that we're becoming aware of because we're talking to um, our, the manufacturers of the products that we use is that their, their target is to produce a product that meets these specifications. That might mean that the raw materials are changing or in some instances that they may actually have to change the formulations. Um, and if you've got the best manufacturers will tell you about those changes, but it's always wise to be checking in. So I said this is a talk of three parts. The next two parts will not be as long because we're going to talk a little bit about energetics and a little bit about metabolism. Um, and we touched on this already. Energy is what we think about as body's fuel. And it comes from three key sources, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. But remember that our carnivores may be using, because they cannot digest carbohydrates very effectively, they will have, this is what leads to them having a higher protein requirement because they're gonna use protein, not only as building blocks, those so amino acids as building blocks for muscle and other tissues, they're going to be using protein as an energy source. And um, so they're having to trade off doing that. And also, as we look at these nutrients, it's important to recognize that depending on how the food is comprised, you're not necessarily going to get that full yield of four kilocals per gram if some of that protein is bound to chitin. Um, now, when we look at this in mammals, we talk about, or sorry, endothermic animals at rest. We, um, we use something called the basal metabolic rate. And I'm just going to show you some equations just because it helps to understand how we would use this to calculate the energy requirement and therefore the amount of food that might be required for placental mammals. So there's an equation here which allows us to compare energy according to body size. But there are multiple equations and they vary to generate energy requirements for different types of. So we start with placental mammals as our, and, and as our, our baseline. We know that um, the two other groups of, of mammals, uh, the marsupials and the monotremes, have far lower uh, basal metabolic rates. And these are, this is the metabolic rate just at rest, just to keep cells alive. Um, and then when we look where this is known, the reptile BMR is far lower. Um, and so the instead of BMR in exothermal thermic animals at rest, we would use the standard metabolic rate. And it's remarkably hard to get information on amphibians. I, I did a very thorough search, and, and, and this is where I think there are, there are people out there who will know more about this. Um, but instead, what I was doing was trying to um, trying to find information, and this was some work that we did in the UK um, using some equations, and there will be many more published since then, but this was a baseline for that standard metabolic rate in reptiles. 
And then the other thing here is that remember we were talking about this being at rest. So we then apply a factor on top of that based on what we know about the animal's activity. So if you've got a very active um, animal, irrespective of the tax service, always moving around, um, has a lot of social interaction versus something that's going to be very sedentary, you're going to manipulate that factor that you apply. Um, and also, I've been talking in KCAL's program, um, but you'll also see the, the um, when calories is kind of our, our shorthand, we're talking about energy, but the metric unit would be kilojoules. So there's a conversion factor there. So I offer this table just to show by comparison with some of the numbers that we were just looking at in placental mammal, just um, how that change in equation impacts the amount of energy. So all of these numbers get divided. If you're multiplying to convert from calories to kilojoules, you multiply. So all of these numbers need to be divided by 4.18 to get the actual energy that would be required for daily activity. But of course, we then have the challenge that you're not feeding your amphibians on a daily basis. You're probably thinking about diets on a weekly basis with a feeding schedule, not at particular hours or times of the day, but on days of the week. So that's what makes energy calculations and energetics, I think, for animals in uh, amphibians in, um, in managed care quite challenging. And so I don't have a lot more to share here other than there's some literature that I will uh, share with Luis um, to make available to this group um, where I'd say it, there's this term um, and studies around Brady metabolism, where we're talking about animals which have high active metabolism when in pursuit of prey, for example, or um, perhaps at a period of reproduction, um, but generally have a considerably slower resting metabolism. And um, it's about that shift that's happening from a baseline resting metabolism, SMR, into high, higher bursts um, when required. And so the list at the bottom here, and so the, 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 the text was about, I could find literature that talks about this in reptiles, um, uh, where it's understood and recognized that the normal metabolic rate is going to be very low. Um, but it, there's that potential to elevate it when it's required um, in these short bursts of activity, usually rather than something sustained. Um, other times or instances where this would change is, of course, during metamorphosis. And I'll touch on that a little um, just before I finish up talking about metabolism. Probably. The, 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 at least one author characterized vocalization as being the most energetic activity undertaken by anurans and uh, anurans um, at all. Um, and the way that these uh, studies are done is they're putting animals into, they're trying to measure oxygen exchange to understand the the amount of oxygen that's been taken in to to um, as a measure of effort um, there were studies that i could find that shows that maintaining thermal balance so as temperatures increase or decrease and um, so particularly when animals frogs are living in, in uh, very low temperatures as well perhaps through seasons so they're getting they're living in in very um, in environments that um, freeze then the the energy that is required to maintain that thermal balance or sustain the tolerance for the living through that that season of lower temperatures will change 
there is effects of altitude and then also um, effects of your prey capture strategy. Are you an active predator or sedentary still in weight? Depending on your strategy, your energy requirements will be slightly different. Are you moving through water or a terrestrial environment with lots of climbing and leaping involved? And then interestingly, there were um, some studies that look at the energy impact of living with predators, particularly on tadpoles or um, metamorphosing um, anurins. Um, and, and I think this is an important characteristic that we don't necessarily always consider in many other types of that I'm working with. And um, there are also some papers looking at the increased energetics of, of environmental stressors and, and including this would be um, uh, things like pesticides. And then just because you can, um, I found this paper about um, salamanders um, and they were trying to understand um, uh, energetics of salamanders by putting them on a treadmill. Um, now, unfortunately, I couldn't get access to this paper, so this is entirely taken from the abstract. Um, I was really hoping for a picture of uh, a salamander on a treadmill. Um, but uh, this also serves to demonstrate the, the type of equipment that's required to get the data to help us understand amphibian energetics, um, and hence possibly the reason why then more studies don't exist. Um, but they are forthcoming. I want to emphasize again this point that adult amphibians are of get carnivores. Um, they require animal material. And, and it was mentioned yesterday about, uh, sorry, it was mentioned in the first session that there, that means that diets are generally higher in protein and fat. Um, and so these are meant to be indicative numbers, definitely not definitive numbers for that. Um, but it does show you some of those percentages that we're talking about. Um, and so our requirement models, because that was a question that had come up before, we're really borrowing a lot of data um, from obligate carnivores, which includes our birds, uh, sorry, felids, birds of prey, and actually things like crocodilians and, and uh, snakes. Just with the last few minutes, I want to spend a very small amount of time talking about metabolism. And so now we're bringing some of this information together where it's the chemical processes that occur to maintain life. And it's going to be about converting the energy in food. So we started with nutrients. We're looking about energy. Uh, we just talked a little bit about energy. So metabolism is the conversion of uh, the energy in the food to the energy available to run those cellular process. It's also about converting that food into, so it's the proteins in food, dismantling them into amino acids and reassembling them as proteins for tissues, the same uh, for um, lipids, nucleic acids, and some of the carbohydrates, and also get rid of, getting rid of what is not useful. And there are two types of reactions, catabolic, where you're breaking down compounds, and anabolic, where you're building them back up again. And catabolism releases energy, and then generally, an anabolism consumes energy. And I did just want to sort of look here at Xenopus studies, because I was thinking, surely there would be information here that is a model. And, and there are some studies of energetics and metabolism in, um, in Xenopus, but it, it, while it is very widely recognized as a model organism for a whole suite of research, and by this list is by no means exhaustive, um, this, the, it's important, I feel, and I'm sure others would, would have opinions here, to also think about the, the life history strategy of this. Um, this species as a model, being that it's entirely aquatic and relatively inactive. So how representative would it be for poison dart frog, a mantella, um, or a tree frog, um, in terms of some of these things that we've just been discussing? Um, 
there is a lot of information, um, multiple studies by this author, Sikor, um, who um, looks at a specific phenomenon, which is the specific dynamic action, the increase in metabolism stemming from meal digestion and assimilation. Um, and there's a series of papers. If you go to, if you do a search, look for Stephen Sikor, um, and his name is spelled the PH, and he runs a lab looking at Python metabolism specifically, but has expanded that into different areas. But um, if you want to go down a rabbit hole and um, explore, I highly recommend um, uh, exploring some of the work that he's done. Um, if this is of interest to you, um, and when you go to his lab webpage, many of the papers that, again, I'll reference here, and we'll be sharing, but they're freely available on the web page. But this makes sense if we think about energetics, that there is this going to be this spike of uh, change in energetics resulting from not only the capture of prey, but um, then how much you're eating, what you're eating, and what your ambient temperature is. Um, and in this study where they took multiple species of amphibians, um, they tested multiple, um, I think there were six species of amphibians and they tested a range of feed types against those uh, species and found a significant influence on the response as um, in relation to the, the, the thing that parsed out was whether animals were hard bodied or soft bodied. And I just have one chart from the paper um, to share, and it's small, but there are multiple instances of this. So this is just one of the amphibians studied, but the pattern was repeated across um, many species. And on the, the left hand axis is um, what it's measuring is oxygen consumption and um, oxygen and um, CO2. So oxygen is uh, the black line and CO2 is the, the CO2 production. Um, and then the bottom axis is days post eating. So they measured this for eight days um, in each instance. And so the pattern is similar that you're getting this spike um, and, in, and it's higher in, in these hard-bodied animals versus um, soft-bodied animals. I, again, in my search for examples of variation in metabolism, um, there are studies that show the impact of dehydration. And this is, there are natural factors involved in dehydration where ponds just dry up. But of course, some of those fluctuations are accelerating climate change. And then predator risk comes up again in relation to metabolism and its, its impacts in single generation studies, but um, there's the potential for this to have longer term consequences. There are some interesting uh, papers showing that um, when um, frogs are hibernating, that they can repurpose or uh, and recycle conserve nitrogen uh, due to host bacterial symbiosis. So I think this whole area of understanding the, the microbes or the bacteria that frogs, um, frogs have and, and host um, is probably ripe for exploration and there will be more to learn. Um, and then there's also studies showing that um, endocrine disruptors in the environment can uh, induce metabolic syndrome and this is specific to the frogs. But um, my second to last slide is this one which looks at uh, transgeneral, transgenerational effects and it combines a couple of different things here. The authors exposed Xenopus, so this was a Xenopus study, to, um, to uh, an insecticide, a pesticide, sorry, um, and um, had them go through from tadpoles to sexual maturation to mating. 
the F1 generation here, you can see this is a, a, a fantastic example of a graphical abstract. So the first generational effects were decreased body size, changes in reproductive system and decreased fertility and alterations to their endocrine systems. And then the F2 uh, generation is where they started to be able to detect changes to metabolism. Um, specifically um, the fatty acids, so the uh, palmitoleic to palmitic acid is um, the difference in, in different fatty acids and the ratio of those fatty acids. And then um, uh, the ability, presumably, of those to um, maintain plasma and glucose levels. So I think this is really important for us to appreciate that over time, if you remember, for those of you who are part of the, the first presentation that I gave, that what this tells me is that the species that we're caring for are incredibly flexible and responsive to the environments that they inhabit. Um, and that has served them well from an evolutionary perspective. But when we introduce changes like climate change um, and other factors into their environment, and then maybe even less, um, less in, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Less deleterious changes just in our managed systems. There are impacts which are very subtle and take generations to detect. But I want to sort of finish on something really positive. Um, and I'm about to show you a, a picture from a paper um, that I will admit is overwhelming. It's overwhelming for me too, but I love the title of this paper. Um, it's Remarkable Metabolic Reorganization and metabolic requirements in the frog metamorphic climax. The authors were studying wood frogs, so it's a rana species. Um, and I am not attempting to uh, break this down for you. You can see the colors show when different pathways are either upregulated, downregulated, or unchanged. But here, the key takeaway is that the tail um is being used and um, there's energy um coming from the digestion of protein amino acids um which is producing glutamine that's an amino acid protein and uh, protein generally um and the liver is being a source of sugars and fatty acids again for energy production required to make this um, amazing change um, from a tadpole into a mature frog. I think that's probably all I can share on this topic. Um, so, um, and I'm quite certain you will have more questions that, that, than I can possibly answer, but I'll stop there um, and just finally make clear um, this is this is a real product, but it's for humans. So this is not a product placement. Um, uh, for amphibians um, at all. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>